All right, guys, very excited to welcome Kim Kelly, wonderful labor reporter and great friend of the show, back to the show for a very special reason, which is that she has just released her very first book. It is called Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. That is what it looks like. Um, the book is wonderful and I think tells stories that everyone should know <laughs> but doesn't know because labor history has just basically been a race from any sort of like official study of American history in this country. So let's actually start there. Why did you want to write this book, Kim? I wanted to write this book because I wanted to read it. Um, as <laughs> a big labor nerd and a labor reporter, like this is the kind of book that I've kind of always been looking for because I'm always interested in reading about the people who have been pushed to the margins, who aren't getting the headlines, who aren't as easily accessible as, you know, the Cesar Chavez's and, you know, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory stories of the world. And I wanted specifically with this book to pull together a bunch of different people and events and eras and present that in a way that shows today's workers that, you know, whatever your identity is, wherever you come from, whoever you are, you, you're not alone. Someone just like you has done something really incredible in the past or is doing it right now. Like, you belong. The labor movement belongs to you, too. Yeah, I mean, Kim, tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that you report in the book. Just give the audience a taste about some of the stories that are undercovered and that people need to know if they want to really know about labor in the U.S. Sure. There's one story about this one woman in Ohio that I love so much. Uh, her name is Ida Mae Stoll. She was the first white woman coal miner who hmm. really loved her job. She had she was a part owner in a mine. She was from a mining family. Uh, you know, she was really good at it. She was apparently, you know, pretty brolic. <laughs> and she was told by mine inspectors, like, oh, you can't work here. You need to get back in the kitchen. Women aren't allowed to do heavy labor. And she was not about to have that. And she fought back in the courts and she got her job back. She got, you know, she wanted to be doing that work. She was told she couldn't because she was a woman and she was like, well, that's not acceptable. That's, this is who I am. And she set such a precedent for other women who are in these heavy manufacturing or extractive industries that have been told, oh, you can't do this, you're just a girl. Like, well, no, we've been doing it for a very long time. And there are a lot of people like that in the book, uh, whether it's Baird Rustin, a queer black man who organized the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, but was kind of left out of the story because various people were uncomfortable with who he was. Mm. Or, you know, the multiracial, predominantly Asian and Native Hawaiian plantation workers in Hawaii that staged a massive strike against the big five sugar companies and won in 1946. Like, there are so many stories like that throughout the book, and it was so much fun digging into them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the um, reasons that labor is really core to my politics is because I think it's one of the um, most hopeful ways to truly build solidarity across these typical divides of race or gender or other identity issues. And, you know, to really foster understanding and, like, grapple with those things in a real way and to also fight for shared collective goals. And that is certainly one of the themes that comes through in your book, along with this tension between the way that working class people are frequently weaponized and sort of, like, torn apart in order to serve the interests of, um, of capital and of the boss class. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of that tension of how the labor movement has both uh, been a source of the best of sort of multiracial working class solidarity, but also a source sometimes of exclusionary beliefs and rhetoric as well. Yeah, that was the part that was a little more challenging when I was researching this and talking to people is that I love the labor movement, I love unions, and I think that if you love something, you should be able to criticize it and make it better. And throughout the history of this country, there have been some really incredibly progressive and radical and militant unions and leaders who really held up those ideals. And there have also been like racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, homophobic bigots, like the American Federation of Labor the predecessor of the AFL-CIO, they were huge supporters of the Chinese Exclusion Act. They were, you know, they have not, they were seen as the more conservative option back in the 1880s when the Knights of Labor, who welcomed all workers, and on, in, including women, they were falling apart. And the AFL is like, oh, well, we're the conservative, like, capitalism-friendly option. And they kind of swept in and, and dictated that rise in their own way. And it's, always been unfortunate to see uh, unions and union leaders doing the boss's work for them. 
by allowing and fostering these divisions. I mean, in this country for a very long time, like black workers weren't able to join traditional labor unions. They were segregated or left out of the, you know, left out entirely. That only changed much later on, much later than is in any way reasonable. Like mm. it's something that we see now with um Think about how Jeff Bezos and his cronies tried to paint Christian Small as the leader of the Amazon labor union, as someone who was ignorant, someone who wasn't articulate, someone who wasn't worth listening to. Lo and behold, he's turned into one of the most effective and beloved labor organizer leaders of our current moment. Like you, sometimes you just have to count on what you and your coworkers see, what you're building, how you feel about one another, and ignore what the people who are supposed to be in charge have to say. Kim, based on what you learned um, in your studies of labor history, how do you view the current moment? I mean, you just brought up Chris Smalls. Obviously, we've followed it here really closely, um, what they pulled off on Staten Island, another election going on this week, so fingers crossed. You also see the Starbucks workers overwhelmingly young, um, sweeping the country with, I think they've unionized now 30 stores in a very short time frame, something that would have been inconceivable just a short time ago. You know, do you think that this new wave and in interest is sustainable? Do you think it presages like a, a true sort of reawakening within the labor movement? Or do you think like, you know, that these are kind of fluke occurrences coming out of a pandemic and the system is still so rigged against workers that it's likely to be, this energy is likely to be snuffed out? I don't think it's a fluke. And that's because we've been here before. You know, throughout history, it's always been those moments where workers were able to build these strong multiracial, multigender, multilingual, multigenerational coalitions to keep pushing forward. That was that's what's make what makes it hard to break. Once you build that kind of community and that kind of solidarity and that kind of enthusiasm, the bosses can't really say anything to you that will get through because you know the truth, you know what you have done. And seeing what's happening at Amazon and Starbucks and seeing the amount of public support. I think is very important too, because you know these are big multinational corporations um, who are sorry who are very well known, oh, nice. and um, seeing that workers at these companies that we know are owned by these you know evil billionaires who have more money than God, seeing that the workers there are standing up and saying no, we're not going to take this anymore, we're going to fight back. I mm -hmm. think that's very inspiring to folks. I mean, if you can take on Amazon. You can take on the richest man, the richest company in the world. What can't you do? And I think that's the kind of optimism and inspiration that we really need right now, especially you know, after some of us lived through the pandemic. Some right. of us are dealing with this inflation and great resignation, all of these buzzwords. What really matters is that workers, and specifically a new generation and a younger generation of workers, are excited and they're interested and they're ready to fight like hell. And we need to be following their lead. Well, I think your book comes out at a really crucial moment. Um, and again, guys, go ahead and throw the book jacket up on the screen. The book is called Fight Like Hell, The Untold Stories of American Labor. And, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are not, there it is, um, we are not told these stories. We don't learn about it in school. In fact, throughout history, there have been coordinated, organized efforts to make sure that labor history is not taught in school. I know specifically in West Virginia, you know, the history of the mine wars, which is rich and, and fascinating and core to that state's identity, was excised from uh, school textbooks for years and years. So at a time when there's renewed interest in what it means for workers to come together and organize and try to unionize and all of the ways that the system is rigged against them, now is exactly the time to really learn what the history of those struggles are, how workers overcame even longer odds than what people are facing today. So I really highly recommend that people check out the book. And Kim, thank you. Congratulations. Great to see you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you so much. Solidarity Absolutely. forever. Yeah. We'll have a link pleasure. down in the description. Appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for watching. We'll have more for you later. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.